Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you know that we are delighted that you have tuned us in and welcomed us into your home. Well, you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we want to hear from you. So all you need to do is send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, today is the Monday right before we approach our Lenten season. Ash on Wednesday Ash Wednesday is coming up. Um, I hope and pray that um, some of you at home are considering your Lenten observances, yeah. what you're going to do. Maybe your parish or your diocese is going to have a Lenten retreat. Um, I think that's a good yeah. thing to attend. Yeah. <clears throat> the goal, what is the goal of our Lenten journey? To go into Lent and to come out of Lent a better human being than when we went in. Amen. Holier, hopefully wiser, if we did some holy reading, right? And we really take in that journey so we can have more of Jesus and less of us. So we have several days, uh, I guess, before Ash Wednesday. And what I've been doing is, is meditating upon uh, that phrase, that word that the little boy Samuel spoke at the instruction of an elder. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak to me, Lord, I'm listening. So even, don't wait until Ash Wednesday to pray that prayer. So carve out time now and say, Lord, I wanna be obedient to the guidelines and instructions regarding the season of Lent. That, that's enough, I mean, that's wonderful. The, the days of prayer, uh, the days of, of abstinence and fasting, abstinence only every Friday, um, the particular great liturgical services that are coming up. But Lord, what do you want from me in particular? Speak to me, Lord. And I think the Lord wants to speak to us in a variety of ways, but we have to listen, and that's the problem. And then, not only that, that we have to listen, but we have to obey what he's asking us to do. We have to obey, too? We have to obey. Okay. We start in thinking, I got this. This is going to be great and wonderful. And then a couple of days in, we're slacking. Right. And, but we have to obey the things that he's calling us to because he wants us to be a better version of us at the end. And Lent is just a beautiful season in the church. And, and some of our parishes, you might be having um, Stations of the Cross on Fridays, ways that you can participate, but do something, take something away, add something in that will make you holier and better. And sometimes you don't have to do much of anything because mm. it's already been laid upon you. And we share about this often, your season of going through your cancer and treatment. And we were in a fellowship group together and people were saying, what are you going to give up for Lent? And what are you going to do? And some people giving up candy and so on and so forth. And it came to you and they said, Joy, what are you going to do for Lent? And I spoke up and I said, Joy's doing cancer for Lent. Mm, uh, you know, That was a great and, Lent. Yeah, and it is because mm. how do you enter into you know, just what God has laid upon you, what's happened to you. Right. Or maybe you're hurting over a marital relationship or somebody's walked out of a relationship or you're having a difficulty with a kid. It doesn't mean that you don't do the requirements regarding fasting and absence, but, but you already have a situation here right. of suffering and, and dependency upon God. And I think in those situations, the Lord's saying, you know, just enter into this time with me, trust in me, and enter into the season of Lent of examination and trust in me because there will be a resurrection. Mm -hmm. And that's what this whole season of Lent is about. It's the final outcome. He's not here. He has risen and he has conquered the sufferings and death and evil and demonic power and betrayal and wants to give you the victory. So may you have the greatest uh, Lent of your life. It's not quite Lent now. So say what Samuel said, Lord, speak to me, I'm listening. What do you want from me in this holy season? Well, and I'm also extremely excited about our show today. We have an extremely familiar, handsome face to many of you at home. Today, our guest is going to be Raymond Arroyo. I thought you were going to say me. You always well, say I'm handsome. always you. Yeah. You're the most handsome face <laughs> in the world. Raymond Arroyo of the world, world over. Movie. He's also an author, and now he's written a new book called Will, Will Wilder, The Lost Staff of Wonders. His first book was Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls. Great book. A second one has come out. You don't have to read the first one to read the second one, but you want to. And so if you're just new to this game and the new to this series that Raymond presents to us, 
Um, get them, it's gonna be fantastic. We're excited. So we're gonna have a great show. Stay tuned, we will be off and running with Raymond Arroyo when we come right back. So don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and we want to hear from you. If you have a question for today's guest, Raymond Arroyo, you can email us, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Today, he's on the couch. He's not in the chair. <laughs> we are going to interview him, and hopefully we will use your email question right here on the air. Well, welcome, Thank and I'm you. so excited that you're well, here. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you're you all best. for having We're me. So it's excited. so nice to be, you know, yes. I pulled the chain up from behind the desk, there and you go. here I am. There I can walk. This is a real walk. room, a beautiful I know. room. This is kind of sterile there. Yeah, you know, it is. Kind of... It looks like an operating yeah. room. This is beautiful. <laughs> and I'm here. the thing on the slab, so. <laughs> it might feel yeah. like that. Some days. Well, we are thrilled. I'm excited about your new book. Oh, thank you. Um, Love the first one and bought it for all of the grandchildren, Aww. all separate households, so they all have their own copies that they could share around. I love it. And, um, but we want you to tell our family at home, this yeah. side of the couch, yeah. a little bit about Raymond. Oh, gosh. His life. This is your therapy session. Much, <laughs> this is much, much <laughs> less interesting feeling? than Will Wilder, I'll how tell you. How are you feeling? No, you how's know, all this going? Uh, it, it, when, you're, when you're working, you know, people often ask me, how do you do all of this? Because you have the family, right. which is your first obligation. Right. right. And then you've got work, and you mm -hmm. have to book guests. And mm -hmm. with me, I do a lot of prep. I do, you know, files, and then I write all my own questions. You know, my, my, my guys are pulling interviews and video and things that we can roll in. Um, and then my evenings and my weekends, I spend in Perilous Falls with Will Wilder and the crew. Mm -hmm. So my life is full. Um, I have a very active physical life and at times a more active imaginative life. Mm -hmm. In fact, the mm -hmm. other day we were talking earlier and I said, you know, I talked to Will the other day. <laughs> I was going to bring that up. It slipped in, which shows you. I was going to bring that up. It, well, you do. You do interact with the characters. Yeah. You do. Mm -hmm. They become, when you, anytime you spend time with anyone, in life, mm -hmm. God, mm -hmm. or a fictional character right. in the case of a writer. When you spend that much time, and it's not just one book, but it's a multiple series, right. you get very close to these characters. Right. You start to really understand them. And they move and they do things and they start saying things mm -hmm. that yeah. you didn't expect, you <laughs> didn't anticipate, but it feels right. So you mm -hmm. kind of go with it. So and it's, it's an adventure. It's an adventure for me. It's an adventure for the people reading. Well, and our life is an adventure. It and is I'm indeed. about Should be. having fun on this journey. Yep. There's no second act here. It's the no. first one. How's Rebecca and your three beautiful oh, children? Oh, she's great. Uh, Rebecca's great. Alex is applying to college. Uh, Lorenzo wow. is uh, going into eighth grade next year. And Mariella is uh, in fifth grade. So mm. they lots of projects and cheer and mm, contests mm -hmm. and it's a busy time yeah. it's a busy time in our lives good, good living yeah good well the review's been wonderful for book one yeah and now you've got the second book here the lost staff of wonders yeah people associated with indiana jones and percy jackson is it they do mm -hmm. yes okay. how is it like that and not like that well it's 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 similar in the sense and i think what they're reacting to is uh in middle grade fiction there is a I think kids are drawn to the supernatural. They, they, they're fascinated by it. At a younger age, you're also more in touch, I think, with the divine right. and with things you can't see and touch and feel. And so they're fascinated by it. So the book, the Will Wilder series, certainly taps into that natural desire. Where I would turn away from some of those other books, um, at the centerpiece of the Percy Jackson series is Greek mythology, mm -hmm. which a lot of teachers like to have kids learn about, so that became a very famous series. Um, in mine, the centerpiece are antiquities, relics, things that actually exist and are connected to lived history, people we would know. So I love the idea that kids are taking a great adventure. They're getting this supernatural jolt. There's good and evil battling it out. This 12-year-old boy is caught in the middle of it with a special gift. Mm -hmm. But along the way, they're really learning about Western civilization, 
historical figures, and it causes a reflection. And this surprised the mm -hmm. daylights yeah. out of me. Mm -hmm. So many families, so many librarians started writing me and saying, this opened up a conversation about family history, our mm -hmm. personal history, or the history of our school. So to get kids thinking about the adventure of history and how the decisions in the not so distant past and in the far past yeah. shape our journey is fascinating yeah. to me. Yeah. And I love that you can go and touch and see these mm -hmm. things in libraries and churches and museums all over the world, and you can. Everything I mentioned in the book, somebody said this, it's not exactly correct, but it's close. This is kind of, you know, the Da Vinci Code for kids. Mm -hmm. The difference is Da Vinci mm -hmm. Code had all kinds of theological mm -hmm. problems and mm -hmm. difficulties in it. But what they meant is it's kind of a scavenger hunt through history yeah. and time. And these things do actually exist. Right. They right. exist okay. in the world. And that's fascinating to Well, me. and the, I, what I like about Will in the first book where <clears throat> he has this supernatural ability yeah. to see the darkness. He does. And then you can say, do I have that talent? Mm. Has God given me that talent? Mm. Lord, can you pray for that gift? Can you ask that it would be awakened in you? Yeah. So the first story takes place in Perilous Falls. It does. Is there a place in your land and life where mm. Perilous Falls really does exist? Well, you know, I, well, I, let me start by saying we all live in Perilous mm -hmm. Falls, particularly today. The world is so unstable. Um, we, we see political tumult, religious tumult. We have it seems an absence of leadership in so many parts of the world today yeah. um, that I think people are looking, searching for answers, and it does feel like <clears throat> we're all about to fall over the cliff here. Mm -hmm. So Perilous Falls, That's unbeknownst good. to me when I called it that years ago, mm -hmm. does capture the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, as I look back, and you know, you write something and you get it out, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute. I know where that is. I know where that came from. And then you kind of trace it back yeah. in your own life. I, I was telling somebody the other day, they said, where did this idea of Peniel come from, which is the museum at the middle of Perilous mm -hmm. Falls, where Will Wilder's great-grandfather has collected right. all these antiquities, real relics, real antiquities right. that you can see elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up, I grew up in City Park. Uh, in, well, I didn't grow up in City Park. I grew up in New Orleans. But I went to school in City Park, which is in the middle of town. And at the very center of City Park is this huge museum, the New Orleans Museum of yeah. Art. Mm -hmm. And it was only a block or two away from my school. So to me, it was larger than life. Mm -hmm. It was this mysterious place. We would mm -hmm. go visit it every now and then, but not often. Uh, I saw King Tut there. I remember mm -hmm. seeing the sarcophagus yeah. and all of that. And it shows you, as an author, you collect things through life, and it gets sifted into the back and sort of almost like composting it it goes down and it turns into something else and it sprouts up as a story mm -hmm. yeah. that's certainly what happened to me yeah. so there are, there's a little bit of new orleans in perilous falls it's a southern town but it's not deep south mm -hmm. um and and i guess there are bits and places uh and, and shades of of places i've been my whole life mm -hmm. that find their way in restaurants uh there are a couple of shops that are coming up in the third book <laughs> that uh, are reflective, I think, of places I've been, but then you change them imaginatively mm -hmm. and you broaden them so they become available to everybody. Yeah. Back to you know, what's historical in the book and what's not. The mm -hmm. first book uh, has the relic of St. Thomas' finger. Mm -hmm. It does. And then what else? Where Elijah? And, they're, and they're the, the mantle of Elijah, mm -hmm. okay. which Elijah in the Old Testament used the mantle to okay. turn back and water. And I think I remember in, in your telling of the story then, there's something was it said in like Italy and one of his relatives and there's an attack and yes. something gets stolen and it was kind of like you know what's real about that what's not real about right. that? something there's that's a real flashback about that. at the top of every book there's a flashback to Will Wilder's great-grandfather mm -hmm. Jacob, Jacob Wilder the first book opened with Jacob in Ortona Italy okay. and it was during World War II and he crawls into the collapsed Basilica of St. Thomas to rescue the relics of St. Thomas wow. now that Everything I just told you, the setting, the timing, extremely historical mm -hmm. accuracy. Mm -hmm. I, I, I worked really hard to build and to understand and to set those flashbacks at the top of each book. They are historically accurate. In Ortona, Italy, the Canadians went in, the Nazis had blown up the basilica, mm -hmm. and then I thought to myself, well, what happened to the relics? Right. Right. And then I imaginatively put mm -hmm. Jacob in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing in the second book. Right, second so the book. second book, you know, it starts out, and I don't, 
it's in Ethiopia. Yeah, is actually, it Axum? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know, I looked at it. I wasn't even thinking. I'm saying, like, why are we in Ethiopia? Is Which is exactly what you want, right? <laughs> yes, um, exactly. He's and a good student. You are a good <laughs> student. You'd make a perfect middle grader. I love it. <laughs> no, Thanks. but you know, a lot well, of it's adults at my read level. my book. <laughs> really, it's great. Tons of adults read my book. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what fascinated yeah. me. I thought it'd be kids, but I always intended it for an older audience if they came to it. Because the kids take the adventure in the foreground. They're having a great ride. Mm -hmm. They're loving Will and the kids, and they're on the... Parents are looking, and grandparents see the deeper right. ripples beneath the surface mm -hmm. of the story. Mm -hmm. The auxiliary characters, there, there are, there are uh, ideas and teachings and Life lessons. thoughts that are happening mm -hmm. around the edges. Uh, almost a secondary drama that the kids aren't... Mm -hmm. Uh, I think sensitive to right. in first reading, but isn't that like any great kids' mm -hmm, book? Mm -hmm. I mean, I go back and I read *The Wind in the Willows* mm -hmm. or I read *Treasure Island* as an adult. It completely changes the way you see that from when you saw it as a child. That's a great book. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I wanted to create that. Okay. But uh, so we go, we're going to Ethiopia. Yeah. Okay. So what's in Ethiopia? Well, that we're going to because you've got the lost staff of yes, Moses. Correct. How does that fit with that? Well, yeah. when I started doing my research, um, and early on I decided, I knew the relic I wanted to use in the second book was going to be Moses' staff because it had so many interesting plot choices I could take with it. And it's a great... Moses' staff is absolutely awesome, right? It, well, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating right. bit it's of... The burning bush. All That's where it's left, right? The burning yeah. bush, he has that. Does it turn into a snake there? It actually comes earlier. This is what I didn't know about the staff okay. of Moses. And then I went back and read the rabbinical literature, the Midrash, which has great, their own stories of how Moses' staff evolved. Okay. Remember, in the, in the Bible it tells us, Moses falls in love with this girl. He goes to Jethro's home, mm -hmm. and he says, well, go out and pull the staff, and it was, it's actually part of a tree. Mm -hmm. pull, pull, try to remove that. Go ahead, and if you can do it, you can have my daughter. Well, previous suitors tried it, and they died in the doing, okay? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, think about that for a moment. And I love this for kids, and it's part of what I wanted to do. Great stories, these stories that live forever. They, we see reflections of them throughout the time. Moses' staff is the archetype for King Arthur and Excalibur. When he pulls the sword from the stone, mm -hmm. and wow. he becomes the king. Mm -hmm. Moses pulls the staff mm -hmm. from the tree, he becomes mm -hmm. the chosen mm -hmm. one, he, he gets the girl, and off he goes. His adventure in life mm -hmm. leading the Israelites begins with that moment. Mm -hmm. And great. that staff becomes certainly the sign of his strength. Mm -hmm. he's, he's in charge of the tribe, but also the instrument that God uses to create these plagues and miracles. And so I liked the duality of that. Right. Um, and when I started doing my research in the Midrash, they say it's not just a piece of wood, it's a sapphire mm -hmm. staff. Mm -hmm. It was sapphire. Mm -hmm. And so I liked that notion that, wow, I just never thought of it. So in my book, it's a sapphire staff, yeah. and it has all these abilities. But it's very true to the history. I tried to be very exact. And um, the other thing, then, then naturally, if you're talking about a staff, you've got to figure out, okay, well, what other, there was Aaron's staff, his brother's right. staff. Some people think it's the same staff. Right. In my book, it's not... But I solve the theological dispute a okay. different way. Don't I don't want to ruin it. Out. So you making everybody happy now? Well, I'm covering all my theological bases. There you go. <laughs> now you have gone to schools, right? And you've Hundreds spoken, of them. right? You've spoken with thousands of students. Why do you think kids are so taken with this series? Well, I think it's twofold. One, they love seeing kids in the middle of an adventure. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize, I mean, I, I, I'm going to cry if I start talking about this, but <sighs> at that age, when they're at that age, they're so precious mm -hmm. because they're open to the world. Mm -hmm. they're, they're right on the cusp of being a teen and an adult, and they're trying to figure it all out, but they still have the heart of a child, mm -hmm. which is open and beautiful mm -hmm. and searching. Mm -hmm. And they're making connections at that age. So I think... They want to go on a great adventure and a great ride, and Will Wilder gives that to them. Right. They also want to understand something of who they are and where they came from. And on a deeper level, that's what it's furnishing mm -hmm. with the tools to figure out. And it's led, and that's what I love that the book has become a family event. Mm -hmm. People buy it, and they start reading it to their kids. One mother wrote me and said, I, you know, I had a reluctant reader in the house, so I read the first chapter. He read the second to me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I used your audio book as an enticement. So if he reads four chapters, he can listen to one on the audio book. So it becomes a way to kind of get him to keep reading. But boys have taken to it. Girls have taken to it. 
it's, it's a fun read. So my first objective really was to entertain, mm -hmm. and that's why they're taking to it. Yeah. But on a deeper level, they're making connections in their own lives. They're having conversations with their friends and their families that enrich this, and they realize the supernatural right. is not something entirely a fantasy, right. but it is a reality in our world, and Will helps you navigate all of that. It's not preachy. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to... It's not a mm -hmm. catechetical text. Mm -hmm. But it is a way for kids to begin to process both their physical life and their spiritual life. Right. And they want them to connect in matter. Right. You know, they're saying... It's I, all one. It's all one. I want this to connect in matter mm -hmm. in this adventure. Where even searching at that age and precious, so tender and precious yeah. stage of life is to be seeking God and to say, what spiritual gifts have you equipped me with, Lord? Right. You know, I'm getting ready to make my confirmation. I want to say yes to everything in the Catholic mm. Church. I want to know what my gifts and talents are. Mm. You know, not just my natural or my mm. intellectual, but God has given us mm. all a, a spiritual treasure too. Well, we all have gifts. We all have gifts that are given to us that are not given to someone else. Mm -hmm. And Will has a pretty dramatic, spectacular, supernatural mm -hmm. gift. But um, gifts can be misused. Gifts can be ignored. Mm -hmm. Gifts can be used for great good right. and for their purpose. He's trying to figure that out. And what I love about Will, uh, there was a, view the, a review uh, in Kirkus uh, of the new book, and they said he's the perfect uh, protagonist, conflicted protagonist. Right. And I loved that mm -hmm. because he's not a perfect kid. Right. I wasn't perfect. You weren't perfect. Well, you might have been perfect. No, but I, I wasn't clearly perfect. not. No. And, and Will bears that mark. He's, he's certainly not perfect. But he's trying to do the mm -hmm. best he can in the moment, and sometimes he makes ruinous decisions. Mm -hmm. But he suffers the consequences of that okay. and finds his way back. That's what we're all called to do. We're going to make mistakes, mm -hmm. but there is a path we're supposed to be on, and there's a, 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 a debt we owe to the talents we've been given. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what Will discovers. Speak as the to series us about this on. school in... Is it in New Orleans? Oh, yeah. Because they, we're saying that we've got a clip of yeah. this group there, that school there, and the this impact the books have made. St. Stephen's School uh, in New Orleans. It is a school that serves very, a very poor community. Amazing kids. And the staff here and the pastor here, uh, Monsignor Chris Nolte, who, whom I know, uh, they're, they're astounding. And you're going to see yeah. the kids and the principal. Her name is Rosie Kendrick. And Rosie is amazing. She loves these children. The staff loves them. We distributed about 100 of the Will Wilder books. The, we went right. a year ago. Mm -hmm. Then we went back this year. And when I returned, she told me such amazing things, and so right. did the kids. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the clip. Will Wilder changed the reading habits by making them want to read. He made them read. And he made them get it. And he gave them the power to believe that they can do it. I like how the demons are trying to take over the world and Will is on his way to stop the demons and to protect like all the relics that the demons are trying to get. So they're Will Wilder. Like they become him. And the demons are their demons. Their demon could be a neighbor shooting. Their demon can be dodging bullets. Their demon could be alcoholic parents or, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. that can be their demon. So even though it's mythical, mm -hmm. it still gives you a hope that you can escape, right? That you can fight all of these demons and you can come out on top. You can be Will Wilder. He adventures, uh, adventures and all that. Yeah, he's not scared. Yeah, he's not scared of anything. And I like how Will's um, adventurous spirit like made him go and get the relic so you know he could find out more about it. But then like um, when trouble started to happen, he fixed his own mistake and I like how he did that. You can conquer those demons. And I think that's why a lot of them like it. This book is amazing and an adventure about the things that you can't do. And if you believe it enough, you can do it. Will Wilder, he makes you escape from the real world, you know? And he's a kid, so it's like, that could be me. I can save the world. And they can, and they will. Like, they will save the world. Hallelujah. That's great well, stuff. We just mm -hmm. have a minute before the break, and I just 
give us a brief reflection on what you've just seen. Well, I mean, I almost don't, I, I, <laughs> I have to get a Kleenex yeah. and wipe the tears. Um, th it's really what I wanted to, what I wanted the kids mm. to get from it, mm. that you have the power within you to change the world, mm -hmm. but it, it's, a, it's a combination of you and your family. You're mm -hmm. not alone. You need help to do it. Mm -hmm. And you have to be attentive to the things you're called to in that moment, and you're gonna have great adventures in life. And there are going to be people who try to deceive you, and there are gonna be people who try to lead you in a different way. Mm -hmm. And you have to be attentive to what they're doing and what you're called to otherwise. And you can be the hero in your own story. That's really what Will Wilder's about. And he is a flawed character, so he gives all of us hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're going to take a break at this point. I'm more with Raymond Arroyo, the new book, Will Wilder, The Lost Staff of Wonders. Don't go away. Plenty more to come. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So if you have a question for Raymond, all you need to do is send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. Well, Raymond's just having this great discussion. That beautiful mm. clip was so precious. Mm, More amazing. than you could have anticipated what God was going to do with the book. Yeah. Well, you, you just look, we write books, but it is the reader who is the other 50% of a book. That's a a character is born in the heart and the mind and the ear of the reader. Mm -hmm. The author just, you know, we just commit letters to a page. It's up to the reader to give Fill it life, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like radio. Yeah. That mm -hmm. seems to be harder than TV. You know, bring, radio? We, we through. Yeah, because you got to paint the picture. Or yeah. You got to help the Theater picture the enter mm -hmm. in. See, I think it's easier. You think it's easier? Well, right? because you're denied the physical. If you don't, you know, you're, you're seeing, uh, no matter what I say, a lot of people, what they're receiving is this. Mm -hmm. They're seeing this. Yeah. So, um, and that is sometimes a negative, sometimes a positive. <laughs> I'll let you decide. <laughs> but uh, but it, it creates another layer right. in communicating. No, I, you're Whereas right. radio, you're shortchanging right. that. It really is mm -hmm. the imagination, mm -hmm. you know, theater of the imagination. Mm -hmm. You can do more in radio than you can in TV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Ethiopia. Oh. Axum, mm -hmm. Ethiopia. Yes. Why again? The flashback at the top of the second book in the series, Will Wilder and the Lost Staff of Wonders, takes place in Axum, Ethiopia. And I put Will Wilder's great-grandfather in Ortona, Italy during World War II in the first book. That's how you, at the beginning of all these books, you learn how the relic that's going to play and be used in the course of the book, mm -hmm. how that relic came into the possession of the great-grandfather and therefore in the museum mm -hmm. in Perilous Falls. Mm -hmm. And in this book, it opens in Axum, Ethiopia, which I discovered when I started doing my research on the Staff of Moses and the Ark of the Covenant. Indiana Jones didn't have to go looking for the Ark of the Covenant. There is a religious order of monks in Ethiopia who have claimed to be in possession of the Ark of the Covenant for centuries, mm -hmm. wow. Centur more than a millennia. Mm -hmm. And the story goes that King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba got together and when the temple went down, he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia. This order, and it's a strange order. They're mm -hmm. part Christian, part Jew Orthodox Jewish. It's very odd. They're an mm -hmm. odd group. But they have a guardian. And the, the Ark of the Covenant is kept in a very small church with gates all around. No one may go in but the guardian. And his life's mission is to protect the Ark of the Covenant. And if you've seen some of these fellows who've been doing it for a long time, mm -hmm. they have milky white irises. Their irises and their eyes are completely white. And, you know, they have, they're, 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 their skin is bleached. Very mm -hmm. interesting phenomena mm -hmm. associated with this mm -hmm. access and proximity to the Ark of the Covenant. So I weave some of that in, some of what I learned and discovered through my investigations into the opening of the book. Jacob Wilder goes there during the war at a time when, indeed, the Nazis were looking for the Ark of the Covenant. That is true. And I have some historical figures who pop up in that opening. So kids are learning about this as they're getting the backstory for the, you know, for the adventure to come. So it's a, there's a lot happening mm -hmm. in these books. Mm -hmm. there is. They're emotional, they're historical, 
and they're a lot of fun. They're a great adventure. They're emotional, they're historical, they're supernatural, yeah. creative. Family's always involved. I mean, Will's yes. is always a grandparent, or there's an aunt, or there's whoever it is. Yeah. There's that connectivity. Um, you mentioned, I don't know if you said it during the show or yeah. in between yeah. or something, but that you don't write a book, you kind of discover a book. That's true. Is that is that true in these kind of adventure stories Absolutely. more than in kind of a biography story? Or well, or? It, it is. It is because in a biography, like when I wrote Mother Angelica's biography, you know, both volumes of that book, you you the story is set. You're right. dealing with set facts. Yeah. So it proceeds on a predictable line. Now, it's not predictable to the reader, but it is predictable to the mm -hmm. person who's mm -hmm. writing it. You know where the life goes. With fiction, yeah. you're dealing with a living organism. You don't know where this story is always going to go. Now you plot it out and you outline, and I do. I outline. But when you're in the creative act, things start to shift on you. An idea pops up, inspirations mm -hmm. come, suddenly mm -hmm. lines of dialogue you mm -hmm. never expected mm -hmm. come flowing out, mm -hmm. and the whole story begins to turn. Well, what are you going to do? You got to go, go with, with it. it. <laughs> that's your crea yeah. That's mm -hmm. when you're in that zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, my friend Bill Blatty and Dean Koontz have said this is when, mm -hmm. this is like the divine guide. Mm -hmm. You know, this is when the Holy Spirit's coming in and mm -hmm. kind of leading you. Mm -hmm. You go with it. You don't stop. You go with it. And that's when the ex unexpected surprises happen. That's when characters pop up and do things. And those, those are the moments, to a fault, where the young readers that I've shared the book with, they'll go, wow, I didn't right. expect that would happen. Right. Right. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. They're on this journey. And, and old you readers. See it in them, and old readers, too. <laughs> but I, I make sure kids, as mm -hmm. I'm working on a book, mm -hmm. part of my discovery, I let kids read the book mm -hmm. as I finish chapters. Yeah. What that allows me to do is it's, it's audience testing. Mm -hmm. I'm testing it out on the target audience. They will tell you, eh, that was kind of boring. Mm -hmm. Why did he do that? He wouldn't do that. They often know your character better mm -hmm. than you do. Mm -hmm. So I take that correction. I'll go back in an editing. I change things, cut things out. I'm very receptive to that. I'm not writing for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not writing for my self-expression. Mm -hmm. I'm writing for an audience. It's right. for them. So you want to make it as good a book it can be, and mm -hmm. as good an experience it can mm -hmm. be for them and to, to, to accommodate their likes and desires. So that's part of it. But you do discover. You dig. You dig around, particularly at the beginning. You don't know what you're writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're kind of feeling your way. So I knew, I mean, just to give you background on this, I knew I wanted the, the staff of Moses, but I didn't know a lot about the staff of mm -hmm. Moses. I mean, I'd seen the Ten Commandments. I've read the, you know, he lifts up, the water parts. Okay, what else happens? You don't realize... Not all the plagues were committed by the staff. Okay. Only about six of them, I think, mm -hmm. in the book, I tell you. Mm -hmm. um, because that becomes important. Have you read the book? I did <laughs> okay. read the book. I read it, I think, in editing okay. uh, on the plane. Uh, but, you know, you, what happens, what you realize is, if you're using the staff, and this is going to be the, the instrument of these plagues, you have to know what plagues the staff right. created and which mm -hmm. one were just done divinely. Mm -hmm. Some of them just happened. Okay. You know, like the gnats, he throws up some ash and the mm -hmm. gnats go out. The mm -hmm. staff isn't used at all. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very specific. Yeah. And then that led me to, okay, where is the staff? There are, by the way, two museums that claim the staff of Moses mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. There is a museum in Birmingham, England, right. not Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, don't confuse the two. So, and and they, there's a professor who claims the staff of Moses is there. I don't believe this, by the way, but he claims it. Yeah. Then in Istanbul, there's another museum, a royal museum that claims it has the staff of Moses. I'm a little dubious about that, too. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it, it focuses the attention on this artifact. And whether we have it or not, historically, it existed it, at right. some point. Yeah. So I like the idea of playing with it in fiction and awakening kids to the reality of history in their own lives. Mm -hmm. That's great. We're going to go straight to an email. It says, oh, good. Raymond, you have such a way with words when you write. Mm. Do you think Will Wilder books are a good way for children to learn a little bit about their faith, especially since they may not be getting much information elsewhere. Hmm. Well, look, I'm not, I, I didn't intend the series to teach people about faith or do, you know, it's, again, it's not catechetical. However, that said, there are a lot of items, relics, and history that does touch on Western civilization, which by proximity right. is the Christian story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you will learn a lot about that. But the ride is what keeps kids going. Look, there are a lot of pious, very pious books you can buy out there. There are lots of them. 
My children have them. We bought them. Mm -hmm. They don't read them. And they don't read them because you know why? It's not a good time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like great holy music. I've heard wonderful, beautiful music and, and you know, people who send me CDs. And you put it on and it's, it's pious, it's holy. But I don't want to listen to this when I drive. Mm -hmm. I just, it's, it's not yeah. catchy enough. Mm -hmm. What I tried to do here was create a catchy story. And a, and, a, and a protagonist and characters that people would fall in love with that you want to go on this journey. Yeah. The other is auxiliary. What they learn is auxiliary. Mm -hmm. my, core, my core job is to entertain them and to show them that we don't go on this journey of life alone. Mm -hmm. We go with a family. Everything else you'll get as well, mm -hmm. and they do. Mm -hmm. Kids are, this is what I love about this audience. I've written books for adults for what, 10 years now, Nine. 11 years now? Read most of them. Well, and, and, and you're good. And, and that, well, thank you. <laughs> but and when you talk to an adult audience, they read a book and they do read it and they love mm -hmm. it. They'll even reread it. Mm -hmm. They never capture and grab the detail that a child will. Children read your book one time. They know every last detail about those books mm -hmm. and their questions are very pointed and particular because they take the book to their hearts. Mm -hmm. It's it, they're in it. You heard that that uh, principal yes. Rosie mm -hmm. Kendrick say, mm -hmm. "They are Will Wilder. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. they when are. they're reading that book. They are lost in perilous. They films. are lost in perilous. And films, yeah. adults don't have that kind of trust yeah. that a child does when they encounter a book of fiction or nonfiction, which is why you do have to be selective in what you give them. Mm -hmm. Very selective. Yeah. But um, they're, they're, they're like sponges. They're soaking everything up, which is why I think give them as much good stuff as they want. But you have to start with things they want to read. Mm -hmm. And what I've discovered is kids want to read this series. They mm -hmm. take to it. It's like, you know, as a librarian told me, this is a gateway drug. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, good. No, it's the only yeah. gateway drug I approve. Yeah, because then they're going to say, what are the books are out there like yeah. that? You know, and then that will hopefully start them. Yeah, you can't more start them at War and Peace. Mm -hmm. It's right. too high. Mm -hmm. It's alien to the child. Mm -hmm. You've got to start them where they are and with their own interests. Mm -hmm. And if you start there, they will find their way to the next great story. They will. Mm -hmm. so. You know, a different genre, a different mm -hmm. way of learning. You know, it's not yeah. didactic. Right. So it, you're just kind of being met as... You know, we see on TV and the mm. arts and music, and sure. it just kind of goes in. It does. Well, you know, you, the defenses are hard to put up, and that's why. Correct. You know, supernatural adventures and so on can really go in that are bad kind of adventures. Oh, sure. You know? Well, look, you've got the whole, you know, my, my friend Bill Blatty of Happy Memory, God rest his soul, uh, Bill created with The Exorcist right. mm -hmm. this whole market, but. Bill was recreating a real exorcism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and showed the con this battle and struggle between good and evil. Mm -hmm. right. Others have taken this and they've just, they've run down the evil path and we just see this bleak story where mm -hmm. people are possessed and then everybody dies. Well, right. uh, that, 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 what, what do we get from that? Mm -hmm. right. I mean, there's a shock effect, but then what? Mm -hmm. So with this series, I've been very attentive to, um, try again, I'm, I'm playing in the same sandbox. It's the battle between good and evil, right. and it's a child's version of it. Mm -hmm. And he sees things and encounters things that you and I wouldn't, and he has responsibilities that you and I wouldn't. Yeah. But the reality yeah. is just the same. As I told somebody the other day, this age group, they're at an age where they're young enough to be open to the wonder What's of the, the world. What's the age group you're speaking about? Eight to 12. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I told you, my, my readers for this book are actually yeah. eight to 80. Mm -hmm. yes. And I've got letters to prove yeah. that. Yeah. Because it hits them at different levels and in different ways. But the core group, right. that when you're that age, you, you, you have the wonder, the eyes of a child, and you're still open to the wonders of the world. But you also are beginning to see the grim realities of life. Right. And that's a special time. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful time. Yeah. And Will's there. Well, we want everyone to go to EWTNRC.com and get these great books. And you yes. also have them out in audio. Yes. And you, um, it, the new book hits, hits when? March 7th? The, 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 March 7th, the, the new Will Wilder and the Lost Staff of Wonders right. hits. That same day, the paperback edition of the first book, Will Wilder, The Relic of mm -hmm. Perilous Falls, comes out. So, hey, it's cheap. There you um, go. Uh, and it's still available in hardback, but I like that you have... You have both options. Just beautiful. But uh, kids love a series. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't just want to read one book. Right. They want to read a series. You know why? They, they fall in love with the character. They want to see where he goes. So th this series, to my mind, as an author, this series has finally arrived with the two books because they now realize, okay, mm -hmm. 
I can jump on this ship because it's going to go on. Right. It's not going to end after. Do you have any month, specials so. that you're doing for the release? I mean, can people buy in bulk or can they do? How about the? Well, sure. They can. Go, I mean, they can contact Random House. They have bulk sales mm -hmm. always. I mean, if schools are buying, right? Um, but you know, they're great deals out there too. But and the okay. audio book is a fun way to to do. I do like I don't know thirty voices on this oh, audio book. And I did this and the first. I'm concerned about that? I know. <laughs> and you know what? The audio engineers, uh, the, the the my producer on this project, who was so good, Robert Kessler. Yeah. Um, I had to look and check his name. I, didn't, I knew it was with a K, but, you know, uh, yeah, you. it starts to leave. Yes, yes. Robert Kessler was so good because he pulled all the voices I did for these characters in the first book and did little audio samples of them. Okay. So when I was in the studio, I could hear them there you go. to recreate them for book two. So, so you didn't lose it's them. A lot, right? So <laughs> you, you don't lose them. Talk to I us do about them all. The, oh, we're going to a break, babe? No. I, I want to know. Uh, we want to get Will Wilder the last... The Lost, the Lost Staff of Wonders. You can go to Religious Catalog. It's item number 39677. Well, Raymond, you've been around a long time. Oh, thanks a lot. And you are getting ready to celebrate 20 years. Can you imagine that? Wow. Mm -mm -mm. Do you want to talk about it? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I I'm not so sure. How, did, how, did, how did the world Is it a blur or what? I mean, yeah. you used to tape here, right? I, I mean, did. I taped right here. here. And the very, you know, when I'm as I'm sitting here, on this platform, this is the platform that Mother Angelica did her Mother Angelica live yeah. show. Mm -hmm. The same platform. Right. So my first acquaintance, the first time I did television here, was on her show, and it was literally beneath mm -hmm. where I'm sitting now. Mm -hmm. um, How did she find you, or you find her? I I was as I I put the whole story in the last <laughs> okay. biography, uh, the sequel to her biography. But um, I'll give you the Reader's Digest. Yeah. She, a friend of mine in Washington, wanted to do a magazine cover mm -hmm. on Mother Angelica, a feature story. He knew I had a background in television and I had written for the Associated Press and columns and things. So he asked me to do the story. I flew down here to interview Mother Angelica. Mm -hmm. And we spent two days together. And after those two days, she said, uh, you want to start a news operation? Mm. And I said, Mm, Not no, particularly. No, I'm, I'll help you. <laughs> and she kind of, over a series of uh, calls and mm -hmm. um, bullying, uh, <laughs> convinced me this was the way to go. So mm -hmm. I, I started EWTN News for her um, mm -hmm. back in 1996 yeah. and, um, and started the world over that same year. Mm -hmm. So here we are 20 years later. It, it's a blur. It's, I don't, yeah, I but, but yeah, it started, we used to shoot right over there. Mm -hmm. I did the show let's here. Let's take a break at yeah. this point, let you think about it, oh. so we can come back and speak more about the 20th anniversary of the world over. We're going to take a break, we'll be right back, plenty more to come, don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and you know, we would love for you to join us right here live at home. You could be in our audience. You could have met Raymond today. How fun would that have been? Yeah. You don't have to go all the way to Washington to do that. You'd have came right here. If you want to be a part and come to our audience, just contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department. Just send them an email, pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle at 205-271-2966. Alabama, Birmingham, you could go up to Hansville. You can see Mother's Resting Place. You all need to take a Lenten journey. This would be a great place to come, mm. physically taking a Lenten journey, and come and see EWTN. Yeah, Joe, you're talking about Mother's Resting Place. And we're coming up on the one-year anniversary mm -hmm. of Mother's passing. We could talk about that, but it, it, it's, it seems like years to me Yeah. That, since that time. So yeah, it'd be a very special time to mm. come on down. Yeah. All right. Well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome on a very sunny February day, day, and hello to all of you at home. Now, because at home is all about family and it's all about life, I want to bring you up to date on something, a recent Vatican development that concerns bioethical issues. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, the Vatican has released an updated version of a previous charter, and it's called the New Charter for Healthcare Workers. It, of course, reaffirms the primary value of life 
life. But in addition, it looks at uh, scientific and medical issues that have cropped up since 1994 when the first charter came out from the Vatican. This new book looks at the Catholic teaching on abortion, genetic engineering, fertility treatments, vaccines, and frozen embryos, and so forth. Now, this was, uh, of course, this is meant for doctors, and it's meant for nurses, pharmacists, others in the healthcare industry. <clears throat> But when you think about it, we too, we laity and the priests and the bishops should know all these guidelines. Now, this was produced by the New Vatican Dicastery for Integral Human Development. And part of that is the former Pontifical Council for Healthcare Workers, which, as a matter of fact, produced the 1994 uh, charter. Now, the charter does not offer complete, exhaustive responses to all the new issues in the bioethical field, but it does add some new guidelines. And interesting to note is the fact that one issue particularly dealt with in the new charter are the vaccines that are produced with biological material of illicit origin. And that is, of course, from cells from aborted fetuses. Now, of course, everyone has the duty to disapprove of this um, biological material. However, the charter doesn't specifically address, for example, the specific cases of those parents who are forced to use vaccines, perhaps to save the life of their child, vaccines that use uh, these cells derived from aborted fetuses. A lot more on this topic, I'm sure, in the future, but for today, that's it. Back to you at home. Thank you so much, Joan. Always a good report there. Raymond, 20 years. We mentioned something before the break. You kind of glazed over, yeah. so we <laughs> took a break here. But is it like that? Joy and I have only done a couple of years. Yeah. We do an end of the year show, uh, you know, of, of certain people. The best, best of. of. Yeah. The best of. Yeah. And it's kind of like, man, I believe we did like 100 interviews and two. I mean, you've done thousands yeah, and well, thousands and thousands. You start thousands. racking them up and you don't yeah. remember or know. Yeah. It is a blur. But there are some big Highlights. things that <laughs> stick out. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you're interviewing popes or presidents, those things mm -hmm. tend you to remember those things. You remember those. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're going to do a 20th anniversary special okay. coming up where we kind of Look back. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover, and and you know, we there's a lot of lot of folks on television. Yeah. They read the questions on the cards, they wait for the answer, and then they read the next question on the card. We don't do that. Yeah. We really talk like we're talking mm -hmm. today, yeah. mm -hmm. and I do a lot of research and try to dig out okay. the 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 bits and pieces of a life yeah. or or of yeah. an agenda that people don't want to talk mm -hmm. about. That's mm -hmm. okay. the juice. Pause mm -hmm. right there because that, that was a question that I've got for you. Mm -hmm. See, there was a guy who wrote The Art of the Deal. I don't, somebody, oh, you know that yeah. guy? Trending with a T. And my, my question <laughs> for you is, is the art the art of the interview? Yeah. You know, really. So please, yeah. ex, you know, expand upon that. Your preparation for that, you know, what you do, but then you're really there in the moment yeah. with the person. Well, you have to be in the moment. I mean, it's a three-part process. That's okay. the problem. Right. This is why okay. so few people can do it well. Uh, part of it is a performance. You have to be engaged, and you mm -hmm. really, and you do earnestly have to be listening to the mm -hmm. person you're talking you to, do. because they know it. Their body knows it if they don't know <laughs> right. it. Right. Uh, so you're not going to get as honest expression if you're just tuned out and reading your paper. Two, you've got to do all your preparation, and I do a lot of prep. You cannot assume you know anything about people, and it's an insult, frankly, to go to people who are newsmakers. I mean, I go to newsmakers. We don't go to think tanks <laughs> or you know, people columnists every week. We, we tend to go to the people who are on the front lines, the creators themselves, directors, actors, writers, producers, uh, p politicians, presidents, historical figures, people, leaders mm -hmm. of communions. Right. Go to the horse's mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're talking about Amoris Laetitia with the Pope's uh, mm -hmm. teaching uh, uh, exhortation, let's go to Cardinal Casper, let's go to Cardinal Burke. Right. Let's figure this out. These are the two major players. Mm -hmm. That's who you want to hear from. Right. So, um, and then the last part of it is really creating an environment where they feel comfortable telling you the things they haven't told anybody else. It is, you mentioned it earlier, it's an art. Mm -hmm. It's an art, and it is learned through time <clears throat> um, and through trial and error. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I've been blessed. I've, I've, I've interviewed, I truly have interviewed everyone I've, I've wanted to interview. Are you mostly secure, like in terms, ever get anxious? about things, or are you just not that kind of person? Not or? anymore. I used to yeah, get anxious. Yeah. I, I don't get anxious anymore. Um, I mean, I want to be ready. Yeah. You know, when yeah. I go into right. an interview, I want to be ready. But I don't get, uh, you know, you, you lose the ability to be impressed by people's names. 
And I am often, and this is the truth, yeah. I am fascinated by people. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by how they became what they became, how they work. The creative process is fascinating to me, why people in public service make certain decisions. So that curiosity keeps me intensely listening and watching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part of it is I genuinely love the people I interview. I mean, I love them. That helps. And, and that does help. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, I love that interview with Jerry mm -hmm. Lewis, or I love that interview with yeah. this one, or I love that you and Mel Gibson were really. Mm -hmm. that's, the, uh, that's the natural <sighs> affection mm -hmm. that's coming out, and truly my love of them, and, and theirs for the moment we're right. sharing. Right, and you that can't does, fake that. No, you no. can't fake that, no, and that really does come across. It does. Yeah. At the beginning of each show, you know, we're, we're talking, and there's so much going on and stuff, and I say, let's love the people. Yep. And that's the right. bottom line. No, that's mm -hmm. what it's about. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is about love. And the more I talk to people, I remember Tim Conway years ago when I asked him, what's the secret to the Carol Burnett show? Mm -hmm. And, you know, why could it only exist there? Carol Burnett tried other shows. Tim yeah. Conway tried other shows. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. He said, I have to tell you, she was extremely generous to all of us. She gave us the laugh. And we really loved each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. it. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. And you see that time and time and time again. That doesn't change here. And that you can't fake and you really can't teach it. Right. You have to be it. No. Right. Raymond, it's a thank gift. you. Thank you. It is a gift. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pray that thank you've you. enjoyed our time here together today. Remember, you're an important part of the family. It's always about family. Mm -hmm. And you're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.